Hello, Book Two. As uh, as those of you who watch my channel uh, regularly will already have been able to divine, uh, I prefer nonfiction to fiction. I I love it, in fact, uh, which can be a little isolating. If I get a new seven hundred page military history of campaigns of Napoleon Bonaparte or the Second Punic War or Congress of Vienna and I think it's read it and I think it's wonderful I, there are very few people I can share that happiness with uh, and I think part of this is because part of the of the, the reading love fest that booktube in particular has for fiction is that nonfiction can seem intimidating uh, a 300 page heavily sourced history of the Battle of Lepanto is going to seem intimidating uh, to someone who you know, it's coming to it cold. So I thought today I would offer a nonfiction starter kit. Uh, Ten nonfiction books that you don't have to have any background at all in reading nonfiction or any taste for it to pick up and love. I guarantee you that these ten books will please you, even if all you read is fiction. Uh, and I wanted to start with something that isn't even a whole book. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an essay. <laughs> uh, it's just, I have it in this little paperback, but you can find it, and it's been read a million times. Uh, it's called The Simple Art of Murder by Raymond Chandler, in which, over the course of 25 pages uh, at most, he uh, dissects his trade, writing murder mysteries, and also the larger book trade in general. And it's wonderful. just makes you wish that he'd written 50 times more essays just like it. Uh, I wanted to read you the the uh, the famous bit, the most famous bit, even if you've never heard of Raymond Chandler, I guarantee you, you'll have heard the, the tagline from this paragraph. Uh, this is where he's summing up what the ideal uh, hard-boiled detective protagonist should be. Uh, in everything that can be called art, there is a quality of redemption. It may be pure tragedy, if it is a high tragedy, and it may be pity and irony, and it may be the raucous laughter of a strong man. But down these mean streets a man must go who is not himself mean, who is neither tarnished nor afraid. The detective in this kind of story must be such a man. He is the hero. He is everything. He must be a complete man, and a common man, yet an unusual man. He must be, to use a rather weathered phrase, a man of honor, by instinct, by inevitability, without thought of it, and certainly without saying it. He must be the best man in his world, and a good enough man for any world. I do not care much about his private life. He is neither a eunuch nor a satyr. I think he might seduce a duchess, and I am quite sure he would not spoil a virgin. If he is a man of honor in one thing, he is that in all things. Uh, the, this is The Simple Art of Murder is a nonfiction kickoff to this volume, which is then a bunch of stories, uh, fiction stories. But The Simple Art of Murder itself, I recommend highly. It's a easy, easy gulp of a read. Next one. Also very easy. If you pick it up, you won't put it down. It's The Red Hourglass by Gordon Grice. This is a, a Delacorte Press paperback that I have, but it's had it's had reprintings. And it is his stories of the world's poisonous animals. <laughs> it's little poisonous animals. The Red Hourglass, of course, being a reference to the Black Widow spider. Uh, there are bits on snakes in here and Black Widows. And also, <laughs> as anyone who's read this book will tell you, the chapter on the brown recluse spider will give you nightmares for weeks. <laughs> it is one of the most sustainedly chilling feats of nonfiction writing I've ever read. Uh, and it's it's excellent not only for that, but also because it, it eliminates the intimidation factor by stressing that these animals live right near you. Uh, you have encountered them, whether you know it or not. Uh, our next one <laughs> is A Reader's Manifesto by B.R. Myers. Very skinny. This is his Jeremiah against all of the stylistic and rhetorical infelicities of modern fiction. <laughs> and his, uh, his pen can be very hot. He can be a very, very juicily irritated writer. Uh, and uh, I wanted to read you just a small sample of that. He, he is talking about Don DeLillo, who's an author who has grown in my estimation as he's written but not in Meyer's estimation. And he's talking about a New York Times uh, review of one of his books by Jane Ann Phillips. Uh, he, he quotes her, a block of her review, and then he says, you couldn't make that any less coherent if you mix the sentences up in a hat and pull them out again at random. 
I hasten to add that Ms. Phillips made all those ellipses herself in a brave but futile attempt to isolate a logical thought from the original mess. <laughs> all the same, she claimed that this passage constitutes strong evidence of DeLillo's understanding and perception. This is the irony of consumer land fiction. Its fans are even more helpless in the presence of authoritative posturing and even more terrified of saying, I don't understand, than the suburban shoppers they feel so superior to. <laughs> the whole thing is like that. Even if he attacks literary idols of yours, which I, if you're on booktube, I guarantee you he does, you will still be entertained by how he does it to the point where you won't stop reading. Uh, our next one is Natural History. It is John Hay's great book, The Great Beach, which is just a, a very poetic, imaginative natural history of Cape Cod's Great Beach, the beach that goes around on the outside of the hook of Cape Cod. Uh, and whether you've gone to Cape Cod, visited it, or only dreamt about doing that, this will keep you reading. It is amazingly good. Uh, our next one is literary criticism. Would you think you said you flame fl fleeing for the hills? But no, <laughs> no, I guarantee you, you will love it. It's On Poetry by Glenn Maxwell. Sorry, this is a, an advanced copy. Uh, in which he talks about the art of poetry which he has participated in and taught for his whole life. Uh, and I wanted to read you just one passage, give you a little taste of what he's like. Uh, any, fo any form in poetry, be it meter, rhyme, line break, is a metaphor for creaturely life. It looks to me as if the most durable of those the most, are most closely fused to what we are most deeply, organisms that breathe and move and have, who one day horribly learn they can't breathe and move and have forever. I was sitting on the stairs at night in England asking my dad, but why? Then my daughter was trotting behind me on a green in Massachusetts asking me, but why? There was a time when you turned human. Uh, all throughout the book, amazing insights into poetry. Our next one is about books. It's Ex Libris by Anne Fadiman, and it is just a collection of delightful little pieces on the little details and rituals of being a bookaholic, <laughs> which will get you reading and keep you reading, even if you only read fiction, because your books will come up. Uh, our next one is uh, a little bit older. It's Venice Observed by the great Mary McCarthy. Uh, it's her um, nonfiction traveler slash history account of Venice that uh, she went there on assignment, knew perfectly well that every word about Venice that could possibly be written had been written already, and took that as a personal challenge <laughs> to write a great book about Venice, even so. And she did. Again, just like with Cape Cod, whether you've been to Venice or only dream about going, whether you care about it or not, her style has never been more grippy than in this book. It won't let you go. Uh, our next one, also skinny, is Letters to Alice on First Reading Jane Austen by Faye Weldon, who uh, I usually don't like. I usually think of her as all wick and no firecracker, if you know what I mean. But this is nonfiction. It's a book about really in introducing someone to the joys of reading. I mean, it's a fictionalized nonfiction, but it's, it doesn't have anything resembling a plot. It's just a collection of letters about an older reader writing to, a, you know, a young relative on the threshold of a reading life. And it's like the Fatiman. It is a love letter to reading. It's just delightful. If you see it and try it, you will love it. I mean, the epistolary form is easy to read anyway, but uh, this will give you insight into everything you read and into the way you read. Uh, our next one, also th also slim, is the single greatest work of nonfiction, of polemical nonfiction, ever done in the English language. I'm, of course, referring to A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf, in which she talks about uh, writing and women and writing and the writing life and very memorably, of course, at one point, the flight of fancy that is the height of the book, she imagines that Shakespeare had a sister and what her life would have been like, where he had opportunities based solely on the fact that he was a man. Uh, and that passage, also famous, like the Raymond Chandler, uh, ends with this. Uh, she, she tries to get a job in London at a theater uh, and men laughed in her face. 
The manager, a fat, loose-lipped man, guffawed. He bellowed something about poodles dancing and women acting. No woman, he said, could possibly be an actress. He hinted, you can imagine what. She could get no training in her craft. Could she even seek her dinner in a tavern or roam the streets at midnight? Yet her genius was for fiction and lusted to feed abundantly upon the lives of men and women and the study of their ways. At last, for she was very young, oddly like Shakespeare and the poet in her face with the same gray eyes and rounded brows, at last Nick Green, the actor manager, took pity on her, and she found herself with child by that gentleman. And so... Who shall measure the heat and violence of the poet's heart when caught and tangled in a woman's body? Killed herself one winter's night, and lies buried at some crossroads where the omnibus is now stopped outside the elephant and castle. Uh, this essay is every bit as powerful today as it was when it was written almost a century ago, uh, and it's guaranteed to keep you reading. <laughs> and our last one, I saved it because it's the most intimidating, is actual history. <laughs> you would think I wouldn't be able to find a short, accessible work of that of actual history that someone new to history could pick up and read, but I did. I do. It's my go-to example. It's 1066 by David Howarth. It's his, it's his short history of the Norman Conquest of 1066. And you might think, oh my god, those are terms from school. I'm bored already. But you won't be. He has the soul and sensibilities of a novelist and brings those to bear in this book from page one to the end it's it's uh, not the most scholarly history of 1066 it's not the most exhaustive history of 1066 but it doesn't have anything wrong and it's amazingly readable <laughs> and there you have it that is uh, 10 very slim look at that that's almost the size of one of the books i like <laughs> well, 10 very slim but very approachable works of nonfiction as a sort of uh, non-fiction starter kit for you. Uh, so give them a try and let me know if you want me to find you a copy. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much, BookTube. I'll see you tomorrow.